Okay. Um, today we're going to talk about one of those things that every Turkish citizen thinks about when he or she has said economics. All right. The topic is exchange rates. Now, here's an admission first. Exchange rates is a topic that, as a profession, we don't understand well. We have good theories about it. We know how it should behave. It usually doesn't behave the way it should behave. There is only one, seriously, only one conceptual difficulty with the discussion of exchange rates. That is, you always have to keep in mind how you define the damn thing. Are we talking about liras per dollar or dollars per lira? This is going to turn out to be the most difficult item in the discussion of exchange rates. The usual convention is to talk about Domestic currency per foreign currency. This is what you are used to as well. Here's the difficulty. When we say the exchange rate has gone up, are we talking about the Turkish lira gaining value or losing value? You're giving me this answer because you're used to a particular definition of the exchange rate, right? You're saying the exchange rate is liras per dollar. When this thing goes up, one dollar buys more liras, therefore the Turkish lira is losing value. Could I have defined the exchange rate as dollars per lira? Could I ask the question, how many dollars one lira buys? Sure. If that is going up, is that an exchange rate as well? Yes. If that is going up, is the lira gaining value or losing value? It's gaining value then. That's the difficulty, all right? The exchange rates come in two basic flavors. Those are fixed exchange rates and floating exchange rates. Sabit de Biskuru. Which one do we have? Floating. Good. A range of possibilities exists between these. You could have fixed exchange rates that aren't all that fixed. You could have floating exchange rates that are floating, but there is some guidance to that floating. But it's useful to understand what these two are. What I want you to understand is an exchange rate is a price. The exchange rate is the price of a currency in terms of another currency. How are prices determined? Very good. You must have studied some economics. Supply and demand. So what we need to understand is what determines the supply of and demand for Turkish liras? Why do people sometimes want to sell dollars and buy liras? Sometimes they want to sell liras and buy dollars. That makes us ask the question, what are these exchange rates good for? Why do we care? Imports and exports. That's one really, 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 really important reason why we care. OK, so how is it related? How are the exchange rates related? How are the exchange rates related to our imports and exports? OK. Exportation is a really awkward word. When our currency gains value, our exporters find it more difficult to sell their goods abroad. Why is that? Expensive. 
it's expensive. The whole point is, when you're trying to sell your hazelnuts to Japan, the Japanese person doesn't care how many liras this thing costs. The Japanese person wants to know how many yen does he, she has to pay for this. Keeping the Turkish lira constant, what happens to the yen price as lira gains value? This is why thinking about exchange rates is difficult. You have to ask yourself, now is one lira buying more yen or less yen when lira gains value? So what is happening to the yen price of hazelnuts? It increases. You ask yourself, let's say one yen was one lira. It isn't. And a kilo of hazelnuts is one lira. It isn't. How many yens does a kilo of hazelnuts cost? Very good. This was your like, first grade math, right? One times one is one. Now, the Turkish layer gains value. Does this mean that one liter now is two yen or it's half a yen? It's two yen. Good. If one liter is two yens and a kilo of hazelnuts costs one liras, how many yens does a kilo of hazelnuts cost? Very good. This was the second item in your first grade math, right? Two times one is two. What happened to the yen price of hazelnuts? It increased. In general, we are content with talking about downward sloping demand curves. If the demand, now, the Japanese demand for hazelnuts, does that depend on the Turkish price of hazelnuts or the Japanese yen price of hazelnuts? It's the yen price of hazelnuts. So what happened to the Japanese demand, the quantity demanded by Japan of hazelnuts? It decreased. Okay? That's why it's so important. That's the export space. Let's think of the flip side. We buy, I don't know, PlayStations from Japan. Right. What happens to, so those things are produced in Japan, priced in yen. What happens to the Turkish lira price of the PlayStations when the lira gains value? It decreases. What happens to our desire to buy PlayStations, right? So what happens to our imports? It says when your currency gains value, we're going to have better terminology for this gaining value, losing value, depending on fixed or floating exchange rates. So what you just told me is when your currency gains value, you find it harder to export and you want to import more your trade balance deteriorates. All right, very good. Now, the questions we're going to ask is, what determines the exchange rates? And then we're going to ask the policy implications of these. Can we mess with them? If we do, what happens? Before we go on any further, I want you to see a, a particularly simple point. Let's say the Turkish lira gains value enormously. So from one yen being one lira, it becomes one lira buys 50 yen, okay? We would, be, would, would we be importing like crazy? Yes. Would we be exporting much? No. Nope. Not likely. Can this go on forever? Does the government have to do something? So that yes isn't an obvious yes. You've studied enough economics to see that this whole idea is built on self-correcting mechanisms. The first you have to ask yourself, if I don't do anything as the government, would this come to some equilibrium, a long-run equilibrium on its own? Then you ask, do I like that long-run equilibrium? Then you ask, do I like how much time it takes to get to that long-run equilibrium? If you answer no to those, then you say, okay, I should do something. So if we are importing like crazy, but not exporting much, can this go on forever? Why not? Okay. 
I mean, when my students perform poorly, I go crazy, but there is no government action against that. There's a trade deficit, yes. No. Ah, there's, an, there, there's a great mistake here. Mm, yes. Um, this was your homework question, I think, like four times in a row, right? Does the fact that we subtract imports from our calculation of GDP mean that when we import more, the GDP decreases? And the answer is no, right? Because if you're importing, you're using these as consumption, as investment. So other items increase, right? Very good. Let's get back to my question. Can this go on forever? Your feeling is, your, your gut feeling is usually right in these things, right? You, you can immediately see that, wait, wait, we're buying from abroad, we're not selling them anything, this just can't go on. But why not? Here's the idea. When we are buying from abroad, what are we giving them? Are we giving them our money, money or their money? Really? So if you are a Turkish exporter and some you know, South African guy wants to buy your goods and says, here's some South African rand for you, right? Is that how this works? Do we see South African rands circulating in Turkey? No. If you are exporting, somebody is either himself buying your currency and giving you your currency or giving you foreign currency, which you convert into Turkish liras. Okay? So exporting means you're demanding, somebody is demanding Turkish liras to buy Turkish goods. What about importing? When we're buying Japanese goods, do we give them Turkish liras? You would find it very hard to go to Japan and you know, give someone a vat of Turkish liras and say, I want to buy a PlayStation. I'm fairly sure you can't do that. So what do you need? Yen. So what happens to the demand for liras and what happens to the, what happens to the demand for yen? Excellent. Oh, Exactly right, and extremely good. You saw the point immediately that if we are importing a lot, that means we're trying to sell our own currency to buy foreign currency. And if we aren't exporting much, nobody wants to sell the foreign currency and buy our currency. What happens to the price of our currency? Ah, remember the whole point was the Turkish lira had gained value too much. That led to us exporting too little and importing too much. That means we want foreign currency, foreigners don't want our currency. What happens to the value of Turkish lira? It decreases. Does this increase our exports and decrease our imports? That's the equilibrating mechanism, right? The question is, does this happen quickly enough? Now, we'll come back to this discussion. But that's, that's an important point to see. Let's first talk about the terminology. This up-down <coughs> up, down language is very difficult because you, you always have to remember which way you defined the exchange rate. Okay? That's why we have specialized language to talk about gaining value, losing value for exchange rates. In fixed exchange rates, if the currency in question is gaining, let's talk about the losing value first. That's one. This is one word you're very familiar with. So you could say, I'm going to have fixed exchange rates, and one lira will be one euro. Okay? And then a year later, you could say, I'm still going to have fixed exchange rates, or I'm going to have floating exchange rates, but now, you're starting from a fixed exchange rate base, and you're saying, I am changing this fixed 
One euro will now buy two liras. One euro, it used to be one euro buys one lira. Now it's one euro buys two liras. I'm reducing the value of the Turkish lira. That's called a devaluation. Okay? Devaluation. Valuation, devaluation. Okay, you reduce the value of the currency. What if you increase the value? What is that called? <laughs> Smart, but not correct. No, it isn't valuation. Those of you who read The Economist have seen this many times because China has fixed exchange rates. China's exchange rate is too valuable. Okay? Uh, I'm sorry. China's exchange rate is too cheap. Why is China's exchange rate too cheap? Why does the Chinese government fix the exchange rate at a too cheap level? Because they want to export. Is the exporting a lot a good thing? You're Turkish, right? Let's think of this. If you're exporting a lot, are you working? Are you producing? Are you using the proceeds of your work? Are you eating a lot? No. no. How do we know? Because we're exporting. Others are eating what we produce. Is this a good thing? You're working for the Germans and the Japanese and whatever. Ah, you haven't seen it this way, right? Well, for what? We export to other countries. Yes. But we also, we are here yes. Currently use all the well, the part that we exported, clearly we aren't. That's the definition of an export. No, we don't have to export all of our production. The question is this. You produce this much apples, right? We could eat these apples. Or we could eat this much apples and export the rest. Which one is better? Okay, you're Turkish. So you're telling me that I'm going to produce the apples and I'm going to let the Americans eat the apples. Why are we doing this? Why is this a good thing? It's, it's just not clear to me that this is a good thing. Ah, okay, hold on. There's another. Say what? Okay, so the opportunity cost of exporting is I would eat it myself, which I like to eat, right? Mm -hmm. I am not eating, I'm giving it to the Americans. Am I taking something in return? Some other goods? No, because, wait, hold on. The answer is no, because remember, we're talking about the Chinese example. The Chinese currency is too cheap. Therefore, foreign goods are too expensive for the Chinese. They don't buy those. Chinese goods are too cheap for the foreigners. The Chinese sell a lot of their own goods. China has an enormous, gigantic trade surplus. Is this good for the Chinese? Do we have a trade surplus? Ah. If they invested, would they have such a large, look, th th this makes sure, thinking in terms of money makes your life difficult. Think in terms of the goods. You produced a certain amount, okay? You could consume this, invest this, let your governments u government use it, or export it, okay? China is exporting a large part of what it produces, and it doesn't take goods and services from the rest of the world to replace this. Or can they be investing? Do you see my point? Just think in terms of the goods and services that were produced. Things that are goods. Right? So China doesn't do much, much tourism. China produces a whole bunch of goods. They export a lot of those. They're going to eat, invest, and use as government consumption the rest of the goods. They can 
you can't invest money. You invest goods. Okay? You have money. What is that money good for? Yeah. What are you going to purchase? You exported your own goods. They are no longer there. Are you? You're, right? That money is good if you're going to import other countries' goods. I just told you that China doesn't do that. Okay? They keep the money as money. So, why are they doing this? Are we doing this? No. How do we know? How do we know? One hopes that at least some of you did what I told you to do and looked at the balance of payment statistics for Turkey. This is where you see those, right? Our balance of payment statistics say that we import way more than we export and we have a current account deficit. China has a huge current account surplus. Okay? The question here is, it's not hard to understand why Japan would have a current account surplus. Japan is aging, they have to save now, right? Japan effectively today is saying, we're going to work for the rest of the world for a while, and then we're going to retire. At that time, the rest of the world will be owing us, then they will work for us. Fair. We as Turkey are saying, we're young, we're not very productive, but we will be. So now we want the rest of the world to work for us. We want to eat without producing much. We want to invest without producing much. But when, when we become much more productive, when we have much higher income, we'll be able to pay this back. Fair. Now, is China, in terms of income, more like Japan or more like Turkey? Is China a rich country on a per capita basis? or a poor country that is getting richer. Okay, so do we expect these guys to have a current account deficit or a surplus? Deficit, but they have a huge surplus, why? This is a great question, okay? I mean, there's some basic economic theory here that works really well when you talk, think about, you know, why does Turkey have a current account deficit? We should have a current account deficit. The only question is whether we should, how large a current account deficit we should have, okay? What size is manageable? Because we're saying, look, we are relatively poor now. We will be much richer in the future when you guys are working. So effectively what's happening is, as a country, we're borrowing to feed you. We will pay back when you work. Cool. Now, how much should we borrow? How much should we feed you? This is a question about how productive will you be when you're working? Should we have current account deficits of, say, 3% of our GDP or 10% of our GDP? Which one can we pay back? How much should we borrow today? Understand that these are two different questions. One is, should we have a current account deficit? And to my mind, there is no question about that. Yes, we should. The other one is, how large should that deficit be? That's a very hard question to answer. On the other hand, the same logic also says China should want to have a current account deficit. China has been growing like crazy. The average Chinese can rightly say, you know, five years down the road, I will have much more income. The average Chinese is as human as the average Turk. Right? Our basic assumption about human nature is we like consumption smoothing. The average Chinese, just like the average Turk, should say, you know, although I'm relatively poor today, I will be relatively richer in the future. I will be eating much more, but I'm going health hungry today. I don't want to do that. I'd rather eat a little less in the future and eat a little bit more today. That means I'm going to borrow from the rest of the world and eat and then pay back in the future. That's a current account deficit. This sounds like a very good story. Why is it not correct? It's not correct because China has fixed exchange rates and the Chinese government effectively is saying to the Chinese people, I'm going to make it so expensive for you to eat foreign goods that you won't want to do that. And I'm going to make your goods so cheap for the foreigners that they will want to buy it. Okay, so we understand 
how this is happening, but you know, is the Chinese government a malicious government? Do they hate the Chinese people and do this? <laughs> You're Turkish, right? <laughs> you have no difficulties imagining governments hating their own people. <laughs> Why is it the case? The Chinese economy is not an entity that we understand all that well. Right? Um, you may have noticed the Chinese government isn't the most open government in the world. They don't tell you much. But this one instance is something that especially the Turkish people should be able to understand. Here's the question. We talked about a lot of what we observe in the Turkish economy stemming from internal migration, right? Movement from people from rural areas, from agriculture, to cities, to industry and services. Here's a question that I have that I don't know the answer. Internal migration in Turkey begins in, at some point in the 1950s. Okay? Over the past 60 years then, how many people do you think migrated from rural areas to cities? 10 million? 20 million? 25 million? In 60 years? Uh, you know, your parents remember the time when Istanbul had a population less than half a million, right? Now it's what, 12, 13, whatever, God knows. Okay, so people are surely, but this happened over six decades. Now here's the question. How many people are migrating in China from rural, area, rural areas to cities per year? That number is estimated to be somewhere around 30 million people per year. You're the government. All of these unskilled people are flocking into your cities. Do you want them wandering around in the streets, you know, looking for jobs and you know, being really miserable and unhappy? Those guys have to work. That's your first priority. You don't, you don't care whether you know, they have high utility, they're doing consumption smoothing, you know, what else is happening. Just, those guys have to work. How do you make them work? Does the Chinese internal demand, or is there sufficient internal demand in China to make these guys work? No, China is a poor country. That's what a poor country is. But these guys are, you know, you know this, right? These are the people you would see in Ulu Sergele Meydanı. Yeah. Literally unskilled labor. Their productivity is low, therefore they are effectively expensive labor. They are expensive in terms of what they offer as production, right? They are not expensive in terms of the wage, but the wage, wage is low because they are unproductive. They still have to work. How do you make them work? If they produced, the goods they produce will be expensive because of the labor cost. Could you make those goods cheaper so that people will want to buy them? How? You keep your currency undervalued so that your goods are cheap for foreigners. Okay? Effectively what you're saying is you're telling buy my labor buy my country's labor cheaply. This is not something you want to do. Right? What you really want is to say I would like the rest of the world to pay a premium to my country's people to buy the fruits of their labor. China is saying, well, I will pay a premium to the rest of the world so that they will buy our stuff. That's what an undervalued currency is. Why are they doing this? It creates employment. Okay? What is the rest of the world saying them? Your currency is too cheap. That is why you are able to sell so much to the rest of the world 
but that is why our workers are not working and your workers are. So what does the rest of the world want? Do they want the Chinese currency to be devalued further? Or do they want it, do they want the Chinese currency to be even cheaper? Or do they want it to be more expensive? The word is revaluation. You hear this very seldom. In fact, until recently, you almost never heard this. You hear this only in the context of China today, but you do hear this in the context of China very often today. The US trade delegation that goes to China, right, invariably, the story is, they pressure the Chinese government to revalue the yuan. When an exchange rate is floating, it doesn't get devalued or revalued. Devaluation and revaluation are government decisions. Somebody is fixing the price, somebody decides to fix that price at some other level. Floating exchange rates have depreciations, where they lose value, or appreciations where they gain value. Devaluation, revaluation, aşınma, değer kazanma. Aşınma, değer kazanma. So when, the, when, when one dollar goes from being 1.5 liras to 1.4 liras, we say the Turkish lira has appreciated. Okay? When it goes back to being 1.5 to being one, from being 1.4, then it has depreciated. Right? It's, it's at least newspaper custom to talk about large depreciations and sudden depreciations as devaluations. That's not technically correct, but that's how you see it used. Right. Now, let's say we have a floating exchange rate. We're going to come back to the issue of fixed exchange rates and whether you can fix these exchange rates at any random level forever. But let's talk about the floating exchange rate. We come to the question of what determines the value of a currency? A floating exchange rate is a market determined price of a currency. What determines that? Somebody answered that question earlier. Supply, Supply and demand. Then the question is, Here we have the price of liras, and here we have the quantity of liras. As the price of liras increase, is the lira appreciating or depreciating? This is why this is difficult. Now, do, do you want, I, I could do this both ways. Do you want me to draw upward sloping supply curves or downward sloping supply curves? Okay, if you want me to draw upward sloping supply curves, then this is truly the price of lira. That is, the lira is more expensive as this goes up. And the lira is appreciating or depreciating? Appreciating, okay? This is what goes counter to your usual thinking of exchange rates, right? When I say this goes from one to two, has the lira gained value or lost value? It gained value because we define this as the price of lira. Okay? 
if, it's, if this is going to be lost value, then I have to draw the supply curve downward sloping. Right? If you don't want me to do that, and I'm not a big fan of doing that either, then we have to decide that on this axis, we're going to have the price of lira. That is, how many dollars one lira buys. When that increases, the lira is appreciating. Okay? Now this is our market the way we're used to. When the lira is, when people are willing to pay more foreign currency per lira, right, the holders of lira are more likely to sell it. You have an upward sloping supply curve. Similarly, there's a lower demand. And you come up with a equilibrium price of this. That's an exchange rate. The question is, what determines the locations of, the, of those supply and demand curves? Now, we think of this in, in different ways depending on the horizon. The most important force, but the weakest force on exchange rates is what is called the PPP. You do remember the law of one price. This was your basic micro. It said the same good shouldn't be sold in different prices at two adjacent stores. Right? If it's the same bread, and if I sell it for one lira here and two liras here, everyone will buy this one, no one will buy this one, the prices will be equal at some point. Right? That was the law of one price. The purchasing power parity says, well, something resembling this should be correct across countries as well. Here's the question. When I told you a kilo of hazelnuts costs a lira and one lira buys one euro, okay, you immediately told me that, therefore, hazelnuts should cost one euro, uh, I'm sorry, one yen. That was a Japan example. So hazelnuts are one lira, and one lira is one yen. A kilo of hazelnuts should be one yen. Okay? That was a purchasing power parity. You said, can it be, so could it be the case that hazelnuts cost one lira, one lira buys one yen, but if you go to Japan, you're going to find that hazelnuts are sold for you know, 10 yen a kilo. Could this happen? Could this be an equilibrium price? Could this be a long-run equilibrium price? So the person power parity says, no, it can't. The idea is price is equal to the foreign price times the exchange rate. So yen price equals lira price times lira yen exchange rate. Okay. This seems like something very basic. That yeah, sure, of course, you know, duh. However, that also means you should never go to some foreign country and say things like, "Oh, this country is cheap. This country is expensive." Right? Because given the Turkish lira price and the exchange rate, you know what the foreign price should be, and the first power parity says, and that's what the price will be. Is it? Are play are PlayStations? Cheaper in Turkey or cheaper in Japan? If they're cheaper in Japan, then this is not holding. Right? Now, there are many, 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 many reasons why that won't hold. Some of them have to do with taxation. Some of them have to do with transportation costs. I mean, if you're genuinely producing the PlayStation in Japan and sending it to Turkey, the Turkish price must have the cost of transporting that item from Japan to Turkey. Okay? However, these deviations, usually the observed deviations in prices from purchasing power parity, did I say purchasing price parity for this? I did. It's purchasing power. Parity. 
Purchasing power parity means your income should buy the same set of goods and services in different countries. Your purchasing power is independent of the currency of your choice. Okay? Why? Because if I earn 100 liras, okay, and let's do this with euros now. Right? One lira is, how many euros is one lira? Atlama, atlama. How many euros is one lira? A half. Okay. What is my euro income? 50 euros. Now, <clears throat> purchasing power parity says, if I know that my income is 100 liras, the purchasing power that gives me, the amount of goods and services I could buy with that, is independent of whether I choose to spend this as 100 liras in Ankara or 50 euros in Frankfurt. Why? It's not even a question, it's a statement. They should be the same. That's what purchasing power parity says. Why is that? Because if one lira is half a euro, should all goods in Frankfurt be half the sticker price as they are in Ankara? The euro price of every good should be half of the lira price of every good. Right? If that's the case, does it make a difference in my purchasing power whether I spend it as euros in Frankfurt or liras in Ankara? No. But even before I asked the question, she said, ah, Ankara, which is the correct answer to the question that I didn't ask. Would I buy more with 100 liras in Ankara or 50 euros in Frankfurt? The answer is definitely Ankara. What you're telling me is that thing doesn't work. Okay. <clears throat> Why does it not work? Taxes, we said. Transportation costs, we said. There are other issues. One is, remember why the law of one price is supposed to hold. If it doesn't, I will buy the bread from the cheap baker and sell it next to the expensive baker. Right? <clears throat> It does then say, indeed, you know, there should be some semblance of the purchasing power parity for hazelnuts, for example. You could buy hazelnuts in Turkey, ship them to Germany, and sell them in Germany. Okay? How about haircuts? Do we expect to see purchasing power parity holding for services? The distinction we have in mind usually is Tradables, ticaret ekonomallar, and non-tradables, ticaret ekonom olmayan mallar. What this says is, purchasing power parity is essentially an arbitrage argument. It says, if a good, given the exchange rate, if something is too expensive in one country, you're going to buy it at the country that's cheap, sell it in the country that's expensive until, given the exchange rate, the prices seem correct. Can you do this with haircuts? The point is, there is no reason to expect this to hold for non-tradables. That already limits the set of goods and services for which the purchasing power parity should hold to just goods. Okay? Then, not all goods are tradable goods. I'll let you think of this, okay? Standard example is, think of those um, cement trucks, right? With those rolling stuff on them. Can you export wet cement to Germany? It probably won't be wet cement by the time it gets there. Okay? It's a good, still non-tradable. 
Now, the definition of tradables and non-tradables change over time. It used to be that agricultural goods, fresh produce, wasn't tradable because by the time it got there, it wasn't fresh anymore. Well, now it is, right? Mm -hmm. We have really bad taste. Now you can do that, right? Now, go to that, you're going to find fresh Chilean lime. Still, even so, I mean, this is something that economists love dearly, right? When you're asked, this is something that we hold almost sacred, law of one price and its international counterpart. Tell an economist that you know, the same good sells for massively different Turkish leader prices in Turkey and in Bulgaria, and the guy will go, that just shouldn't happen. Right? But it does. So why? One of the reasons is these are hard things to detect, deviations from the purchasing power parity. Person power parity holding requires someone to say, oh, I realize that, you know, what is the German price of this board marker? How much would this cost in Frankfurt? None of us know. So is it, is it cheaper than the Turkish their price, considering the euro, or more expensive, or what? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I just don't know. If we don't know, is there any reason for the person price parity, the power parity, to hold? Someone has to notice that this item is way too expensive in Turkey and too cheap in Germany. Buy this in Germany, sell it in Turkey, so that demand for this good in Germany has increased. Its price, German price will increase. Right? Supply of this good in Turkey has increased, so that its Turkish price will decrease, so that this will hold. Well, none of us know what the price is in Germany. How is that going to work? You mean to see that this is a very, very weak, slow force. It's a very potent force. Eventually, someone realizes eventually this works. Okay? But it works very slowly. Another reason why it works so slowly is you ask yourself, let's say the purchasing power parity held exactly. Okay? One euro was two liras. And for all goods and for all tradables, the purchasing power parity held exactly. We were just, you know, the happiest economists in the world. Our theories worked. And then you wake up one morning and one euro buys 1.9 liras. Can this happen? It happens every day. What happened now? Is the purchasing power parity still holding? No. Why? Because the German prices didn't change. The Turkish prices didn't change, but the exchange rate changed. What will happen? What has to happen is either the Turkish producers will increase or decrease their prices. Yes, I can ask again. What will happen? The, this good, let's say this was 50, 50 cents in Brussels. Okay? One euro bought two liras, and it was one lira in Ankara. Okay? So the low home price, the person prior parity holds exactly. Cool. Then we wake up, and the exchange rate is. 1.9 euros, 1.9 liras per euro, okay? Now, is this thing still one lira? Do prices change that quickly? I mean, look, it says here, I'm sorry. It says here, made in Japan, okay? Apparently we're importing these from Japan. Does the Japanese yen fluctuate against the Turkish leader every day? Yes. Yes. That's what it means when we say we have a floating exchange rate. The, no, no, no. Ah, 
That's my question. The, the exchange rate changes every day. Should the price of this good change every day if the purchasing power parity is going to hold? Yes. Does it? No. OK. Why not? Producers don't want to change their prices every day. right? If you're going to say, ooh, the Turkish price is wrong given the Japanese price, OK? You should either say, I'm going to buy these in Turkey and sell them in Japan, or buy these in Japan and sell these in Turkey. Would you dare do this if you're not sure what the exchange rate will be tomorrow? The deviations have to be large and persistent for people to actually change their behavior to take care of this. Okay? That's another reason why it doesn't hold very strongly. But you know that eventually you work in this direction. The reason why we're so fixated on this is, let's write this here. Is the Turkish lira these days too cheap or too expensive? What's your opinion? So what's the, what's the exporter's opinion? I'm asking you now a really easy question. The exporter's opinion never changes. Okay? They always think the Turkish lira is too expensive. Why is that? Because they want it to be cheaper so that they can sell more. But it's not just the exporters. People are usually afraid when Turkish lira gains value or loses value when this thing moves around. Now, <laughs> here's an important concept for us. We can think of a real real exchange rate. That idea can be defined in levels and in changes. And it's easier to motivate in changes, so I'm going to do that, and I'm going to tell you that, but it also applies in levels. Here's the point. Let's say there is a very even inflation in Turkey. The price of all goods, services, everything increases 10%. Okay? Let's also say there is zero inflation in the euro area. The euro area prices of no goods and services change. Okay? What should happen to the exchange rate? Should the Turkish lira gain in value or lose in value? Gain. Oh, hold on. There are two different questions. I'm not asking whether the lira gained in value or lost in value. Should, if the purchasing power parity is going to hold, should the lira gain value or lose value? P increased, okay? P foreign didn't change. What should happen to E? Very good. If it increases, is the lira gaining value or losing value? Is the lira appreciating or depreciating? Mm. Now you're confused. Which way did we define this? Is this liras per euro or euros per lira? Let's think of this. This is going to be a Turkish lira price. This is a euro price. This is something that converts euros into liras. Is this liras per euro or euros per lira? <laughs> About two thirds of you, I think, gave the correct answer, and a third gave the wrong answer. Here is how you want to think of this, right? If the euro goes from being two, okay, two liras to being four liras, do we expect the Turkish lira prices to increase or decrease? <laughs> it gives you a headache. It's not difficult, but you have to keep your accounting straight. 
Let's write this down. Let's do this. 1 equals 1 times 1. OK? You're laughing, but you couldn't answer the question a minute ago. 1 lira is 1 euro times the lira euro exchange rate. And the question is, which way did we define this exchange rate? OK? That is, when this thing goes up, when this goes up, is the lira appreciating or depreciating? OK? Now, we're saying we're going to keep the euro price of this good constant. This is still one euro. OK? But the exchange rate is going to change. It's now going to be two. OK? What happened to the Turkish lira price? Salah, okay, yes. Two. Assuming that the Persian power parity holds. Now, now the question is, does this change from one to two mean an appreciation of the lira or a depreciation of the lira? It's a depreciation. Very good. How did we decide this? Because we thought, look, if the lira is appreciating, Foreign goods should become cheaper for us. But it seems they become more expensive. Our currency must have lost, lost its value so that something that has the same foreign price is now more expensive for us. This is a depreciation because we defined the exchange rate as liras per euro. OK? This is how you're used to thinking of the exchange rates anyway. Now. But what this says is did anything real change? Did the real price of this item change in Turkey? Did the relative price of this item in Turkey versus in Luxembourg change? I could buy this in Turkey, right? Convert the currency into euros and sell it in Germany, that would be one, right? What this says is one board marker is worth, one board marker in Ankara is worth one board marker in Luxembourg. That's the real exchange rate question, okay? Are we still saying the same thing? Yes, I could pay two for this, but the exchange rate will also cost two. So I could sell this one board marker in Luxembourg, get one euro, sell that one euro, get two liras, and buy this board marker for two liras. Did anything real change? No. That's why we can think of a real exchange rate. Okay? The real exchange rate is exchange rate times the price divided by the foreign price. The idea is this. The exchange rate as a number has no meaning. Okay? I could tell you that against the um, Mongolian currency, the Turkish lira is 1 for 50. Are goods and services in Mongolia cheap? I just told you the exchange rate, right? It's 50. Are things in Mongolia cheap? We can't know this unless we know the Mongolian prices. Okay? That's why you understand that there is this real item to be considered here. What matters is what is the exchange rate and what are the relative prices. Okay? If the person power parity holds, the real exchange rate is always one. Right? We know that it doesn't hold, so we could ask. What happens if it doesn't hold?
If the purchase of power parity does not hold, then you can talk about cheap countries versus expensive countries. The same good will be cheaper in Turkey than in Greece. Even after you take into account the exchange rate. If that's the case, then we're saying Turkey is too cheap. That means our real exchange rate is undervalued. Okay? Our currency in real terms is undervalued. Is Turkey cheap? <coughs> is Ankara or London cheaper? That's easy, okay? When one of the comparison countries is London, it's always the other city is London, it's always the other city that's cheaper. Now, the exporters then say, what? Which way should our exchange rate be moving then? If we are too cheap, Okay, should our currency appreciate or depreciate? I don't care about the exporters, right? For economists, if we are saying, if you're telling me that Turkey is cheap, okay, should our currency appreciate or depreciate? It should appreciate, okay? Why should it appreciate? We're cheap, foreigners will want to buy our stuff, we won't want to want buy foreign stuff, okay? It will therefore gain in value, right? Is this what the exporters say? They think that the Turkish theory is overvalued and it should be cheaper. Can these two things be correct simultaneously? Yes. How come? They are not talking about the same set of goods and services. London is expensive because rents are insane, okay? But housing is a non-tradable. The question is, the exporters are talking about the tradables, okay? It's not clear to me that they are correct for tradables either, but you have to understand that you could have both of these things correct simultaneously if you are talking about two different sets of goods and services. What worries people is the following. Let's say we think the person power parity eventually holds, okay? Now, we have the foreign price and the exchange rate. Over the past, say, year, what happened to the lira dollar exchange rate? Okay, it moved around some, but by and large, it just didn't change much, okay? Let's Say this was constant, okay? Nothing big happened. What happens to prices in the US? What was the US inflation rate? So it was about like 2%-ish, okay? I'm not, I, I'm not sure about the number either, but the ballpark number is correct. What about the Turkish inflation? Let's say about 10%, okay? Now clearly, purchasing power parity didn't hold in changes. This didn't change, this changed a little, this changed a lot. That shouldn't happen, okay? Because what that purchasing power, what that purchasing power parity implies is that Changes in the price of one country, that is Turkish inflation, should be US inflation plus the depreciation of the currency. Why plus? I'm not going to tell you why. Here's what, we, here's what you really do. You take the logarithms of this and then take differences so that these are percentage growth rates. This is an inflation, this is an inflation. This is a growth rate, okay? When you take the logarithm, what happens to multiplicative terms? They become additive, okay? So I just told you why. So 
that says Turkish inflation should be the US inflation plus the percentage depreciation in the lira. This says, well, it wasn't. Percentage depreciation in the lira was zero. US inflation was 2%. That means Turkish inflation should have been 2%, but it was 10%. Now, which way do we think things change? It means this is something people in Turkey talk about a lot in different ways. Okay? What they say is, right after the 2001 crisis, one dollar bought about 1.8 liras. Okay? So let's not, let's not do this over one year, let's do this over almost 10 years. It now buys 1.5. What happened to this? It decreased. Okay? Cumulative 10 years inflation in the US was tiny. This increased a tiny bit. Okay? What should have happened to this? Constant. Almost constant or tiny increase, depending on which one of these is larger. Okay? But this is what happened, right? Because think of this. We had you know, 40% inflation, then 30% inflation, then 20% inflation, then 12% inflation, then 8% inflation, right? Those are the numbers we're adding up, the 10 years cumulative inflation. Yes, we are disinflating, but still the 10 years inflation isn't a small number in Turkey, okay? This was huge. What happened? What happened to the real exchange rate? The lira appreciated or depreciated in real terms? Every time, this is hard, you have to think of this, but you're getting the right answer. The lira appreciated, okay? In real terms, the lira appreciated. The exporters are saying, look, over the past 10 years, the lira appreciated. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's therefore overvalued. Is this correct? No. Look, but but bunu hep yutturuyorlar insana, tamam mı? You can't make judgments about levels just by knowing changes. What they're telling you is the real value of the lira has increased. Okay, this this is factually correct. Th this we know how to measure. Then they say, thus it's overvalued. Well, perhaps it was undervalued earlier. Unless you know where it started from, whether it started from a correct level, the change doesn't tell you anything about whether the change was in the right direction or the wrong direction. Okay? Here's the question. Do you think that right after the crisis, the price of 1.8 per dollar was the correct Turkish lira price? No. Well, if the answer is no, then you can't say the lira is overvalued now. Right? What you're telling me is, ah, the lira was undervalued at the time. Okay? So perhaps now it's at the right value. Perhaps it's still undervalued. Perhaps it's overvalued. We just don't know. But if we think that, this is correct. The exporter's argument is right. The point that you know, right after the crisis in 2001, the lira actually had the correct value, okay? Then this happened. It says, you move to some wrong, quote unquote, wrong value. Something has to change. Either the price level in Turkey will fall. I don't think so. Or the US is going to have enormous inflation. I don't think so. Or the exchange rate in Turkey is going to jump up like crazy. Which one is the most possible solution to this? The last one. Have we seen this happening in Turkey before? Sure. This is why people are afraid, okay? Whenever they see, look, the exchange rate isn't depreciating, but the lira is appreciating in real terms, what they say is, ah, okay, the government is doing this on purpose. They're telling us there are floating exchange rates, but they are actually fixing it, okay? And we're gonna talk about how that works on Monday. That fix is going to explode in our hands at some point, and then we're going to end up with this carnage where, you know, dollar jumps to two and a half liras. 
I don't think that's what's going on, okay? But our collective memory has too many of those episodes. So people are afraid. Because when you see this set of facts, and these are the facts, right? Compared to right after the 2001 crisis, the lira has appreciated in nominal terms, it has appreciated like crazy in real terms. And people are saying, since our currency is a bad, shitty currency that nobody wants, okay, any appreciation must be a mistake, which will be eventually corrected. My feeling is perhaps the perception of our currency has changed. Perhaps now we are a better country. Perhaps now people want to hold our currency more, and therefore the correct equilibrium value of our currency might be higher. Higher in terms of more appreciated. If that's the case, then that could work. Let's talk about that on Monday, okay? We have a bit more time to go, but I'm gonna cut you some slack because this is the kind of thing that gives you a headache. But you have to think about this, okay? This is easy, but confusing.